chapter 18. We're combining chapter 18 and 19 together. Um, endocrinology, we're going to start with central endocrine glands uh, with chapter 18. Chapter 19 is going to be peripheral, so we're going to sort of just use one unit. When you do the homework, you'll find that the questions um, for 18 and 19 together make up the, the homework, I think. So be able to be ready to dig through both of those chapters. Um, <clears throat> again, remember, I'm going to finish 18 today. Um, I'll do 19 on what do I lecture again Wednesday. And then uh, next week, we'll finish out with uh, reproduction. Hopefully, I'll get that done. That's a big chapter. I've got a lot to talk about. It's very interesting. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, a lot of it's very applicable to you, especially. Uh, I'll, I'll talk about uh, female physiology a lot. I do not get a chance to talk about male physiology a lot. But, um, <clears throat> it's, you guys are far more complicated. <laughs> so <laughs> we'll, we'll talk about that. Um, and, um, of course, then there will be no separate test for, remember that, there will be no separate test for 18, 19, and 20. Um, the material that you'll be responsible for knowing over those chapters should be on the final exam study guide. So look and see what I'm getting, what I'm looking for out of those chapters. Um, and the final exam will be cumulative. It'll be over um, everything that we've done, but half of it will be just over 18, 19, and 20. So most of it will be over these last three chapters. The other half of it will be from stuff that we've already uh, talked about. Um, the review sheet, like I said before, the final exam review sheet should be um, questions that you've already seen before. The part, obviously not over 18, 19, and 20, but prior to, um, you should have seen these questions before. Now, what I will do, and I haven't done yet, is figure out what, and you can probably do it yourself, but figure out what questions, obviously, were on those. Look back on your study guide, the ones I told you to cross off on that one chapter we didn't do. If any of those show up on here, obviously, you don't have to answer those. Those won't be on the exam. Um, I'll, I'll take a look before then and try to, try to tell you which ones to cross off, but you should be able to tell. Okay, <clears throat> any questions before I get going? The final will be on Friday, I believe, during lab time. Is that right? Yeah. So I'll, I'll check again. for It should be in your uh, – I didn't know how it was going to work exactly when I made up the syllabus at the beginning of the semester. So it was a little unclear. Um, there should be a schedule in your bulletin because they do it differently. Now we went on finals week last semester. We didn't have a finals week. We just went classes all the way through, so the scheduling I didn't understand. That last week, we just have finals. As far as I know, if, if I'm missing something, you can tell me. Um, if I need to, uh, well, let's see how we get, how far I get. Oh, I can. I'll be available. If we, I mean, I'll certainly be available. Um, we'll, we'll look at it then. If I, get, if I can finish next week with reproduction, which I probably won't, but if I get done, then we'll have Monday, Wednesday to review if you want to or ask me questions. If nothing else, then I'll finish lecturing on, like, on Monday, and we'll at least have probably a Wednesday to wrap things up. Um, so let's, we'll see. But I, I, I mean, you may have, check and make sure you may have other finals during that time. I don't know. You'll have to check the, uh, your other classes, check the handbook and that kind of thing. It tells you what, if your days, if you meet at a certain time, what, what day your finals will be. So. All right. <clears throat> Chapter 18. Um, as far as endocrinology goes, we're talking about hormones. This is interesting, um, because these are little chemicals that are going to be floating around that control everything that happens. Um, and, and, a lot of our medication, um, you know, and, and medical treatment in general gears around, you know, the effects uh, of these hormones. Um, a lot of the medications themselves are hormones or, or you know, synthetic derivatives of hormones. Um, so here's some common um, endocrine glands. You should know most of these from your basic anatomy studies now. You may not know the physiology of them, um, but you should know that your hypothalamus, where it's at in your brain, um, you should know the pituitary gland is going to be very important. You think of pituitary gland, what most people think of is growth hormone. Um, and growth hormone is important. We'll talk about that. But there's also five other hormones that we're going to talk about associated with what's called the anterior pituitary. And then there's a couple others from the posterior pituitary. I'll show you what I mean. Thyroid, of course, is a little uh, butterfly shape. This actually, um, the... Well, the thymus actually has, has shrunk. Remember, we talked about it in the immune system that it's bigger in children and it gradually atrophies as you get older. Um, actually, it, it sort of a, a, sits right on top of the heart. It's not even separated as far as what it is in this picture. But the thymus is up around the larynx area. Um, thymus, or sorry, thyroid, not thymus. The thymus down here is going to be T cell maturation, that kind of thing. Um, it has a little bit of an endocrine function. Uh, but the thyroid is going to have a little, be a little bit more complicated. We're going to talk about that in Chapter 19. 
Um, we know that hyperthyroidism, hypothyroidism, that can affect weight, that can affect um, mood, it can affect um, total energy levels, that kind of stuff. Why is that? What is the role in metabolism? We'll look into that. Um, the heart actually has some cells that are endocrine in nature. Um, it can secrete things that, that will go into the blood. There are certain cells, certain cardiac cells that can secrete products that go into the bloodstream and communicate with the, other, the rest of the body. The stomach can do it. We talked about gastrin and, and, and all these other ones that, that were, uh, we mentioned at the end. Uh, so with, digestive, with digestions, we talked about hormones, right? Um, the adrenal glands uh, on top of the kidneys, um, you think of, when you think of adrenal glands, you think of adrenaline, which is actually sort of like a, a neural hormone. Um, epinephrine, norepinephrine, the whole fight or flight stress response, um, that certainly is, is, is important. However, uh, there's a lot more that our adrenal glands do that you probably don't really stop and think about. We'll talk about that. Um, the pancreas, we talked about the hormones and the insulin, glucogen, that kind of stuff. Um, the kidneys, renin, the whole renin, angiotensin, aldosterone mechanism, that was pretty complicated. Um, so that's, that's hormone induced. So you can see that there's obviously in the sexual region there's, there's hormone activity. Um, so we've got a lot to talk about. Um, <clears throat> okay. Um, so hormones are just any chemicals that go into the blood and then circulate and then communicate at some level with a target cell that's farther away. Um, this is not a local situation. Now, in the case of, like, gastrin in the stomach, we know that, like, in this uh, area down here in the stomach where gastrin is produced, it actually ends up going back and affecting sort of the top part of the stomach. But realize that it doesn't just get secreted into the stomach and that's it. It actually gets secreted out into the bloodstream. It has to travel around the body before it gets back to that stomach, okay, to the top part of the stomach. So it's what you'll get and what you will find is that both the nervous system and the endocrine system communicate with the body and get things done. The difference is when it's quick, fast, um, and its effects are short term, that will be the nervous system. And one is longer, more deliberate. And, it's, and thus the effects are long term, and that's going to be the endocrine system. Okay? Know what a target cell is? A target cell is what the hormone affects. Okay? Uh, wherever it lands, whether it's in your big toe or whatever, uh, if it's produced in your head and it lands in your big toe, then the target cell is down there in your big toe, and this hormone, as it interacts with the cell membrane, is going to cause something to happen on, on the target cell. Okay? We have hormones and neurohormones. I want you to understand the basic difference between them. Hormones are the chemicals that are produced by glandular cells. They are cells that are made, they're, they're, they're protein structure, they're, they make their proteins, they use their ribosomes, their Golgi bodies, their ER, and they make these hormones and they release them. That's their job. They're regular cells other than that. Neurohormones are a little bit different because they are hormones that get released, but they are things that are released by nerve cells. Okay? Um, they are sort of like neurotransmitters who don't just transmit nerve impulses, but instead um, they, there's a, a nerve a path, uh, I guess a nerve message that is sent, and when it hits these cells, it causes them instantly to trigger that and release those hormones into the blood, so it's pretty fast, right, as opposed to just something's released, it travels around for a while, then it hits something else. This is fast. This is like adrenaline, for example, why it works so fast, because it's released instantly. There's, it, it's, as soon as the nerve pathways call for it, those neurons fire, and the one at the very end, it, when it releases its its chemical, instead of it being a neurotransmitter that goes to the next cell, it actually is released into the bloodstream, and then it can act whatever, on whatever's around it. Okay? So a neurohormone is released by neurosecretary neurons, um, whereas hormones are released by glandular cells. Okay? But they sort of have the same uh, way that they work. They both affect target cells. Okay, so I talked about this already. <clears throat> Endocrine is different than the nervous system because you get a longer duration. Okay, it sort of smooths things out. Um, it, it, long term, it balances everything out. It, it, if we rely solely on our nervous system to make our changes daily and to maintain homeostasis, everything would be sort of herky-jerky. Um, things would happen, then it would stop, then we would go back and forth. The endocrine system releases more slowly. It, it stays out there a little bit longer. It gets taken up and, and put away more slowly, so you get a smoother transition and sort of a, a constant maintenance of homeostasis. It sort of goes over the top of everything else and smooths it all out. Okay, something else I want you to know here is what I mean by tropic hormone. Um, if you study, I'm not saying that you have, but if you study biology, the word trophic, the word trope, um, it has to do with levels, okay? Um, in particular, trophic means like food levels, you know, like the, the, the producers and the consumers and all that kind of stuff. Um, 
in our case, tropic hormone, what you will see is that there is a hierarchy of hormones in our body. There are some that are just sort of the, the masters of the whole domain of the entire body. There's a handful, very few, that when they act, they in turn act on their subjects, so to speak, um, and then those guys can act, and then they all branch out and affect certain areas, and then those areas, it's just like a management chain in a, in a, in a big company. You got the guys on top, and you got the little people at the bottom. Hormones work the same way. So some hormones are tropic hormones. Tropic hormones means they're sitting at the top, and they run the whole show. So if something goes wrong with a tropic hormone, there could be many things that go wrong down the line. So the farther down the line you get, and if there's an error, actually probably the better off you are, right? Because it's, it's affecting less below it. There's not much more below it. All right, now what you will see is, I'm going to come back to this, but your pituitary gland it's right the size of a pea, right? It's right at the sort of the, the, the bottom and the front of your brain. It sits right behind the optic chiasma, which is where your optic nerves come back and cross at the base, sort of the bottom underneath your, your cerebrum there. Um, it sits in a little, see if you remember this from, from anatomy. In the skull, if you open it up, there's a little, uh, it's sort of shaped like a saddle. That's how it got its name. A little saddle, a little dip that the, the, the actual pituitary gland sort of sets right in. Remember what that's called, that little dip in the skull? No, that's a part of the brain. It's called the cella tertia. I don't know if you remember that or not. Oh, well, come on. The cella tertia. Um, anyways, the pituitary gland sets right in there. It's about the size of a pea. But even though it's so small, I mean, its implications are huge. I mean, there's, there's a lot that is, your entire hormonal system is, is regulated by this. So like a pituitary tumor, big deal, right? I mean, there's a lot that could go wrong. All right, well, anyways... What we're going to look at, and I'll show you some pictures in a minute so it'll become clear, anterior versus posterior pituitary. Now, we know that anterior is towards the front, right? Um, so it will be towards this side of the pituitary, and posterior is going to be the other side. Okay? So we would divide it sort of in front and back. And the reason that we divide it is because the cells are actually different in the front and the back. Um, the ones in the front, the anterior pituitary, are actually glandular tissue. They are cells that have the ability to produce and release hormones. Now what you will find about the posterior pituitary is that hormones are channeled through it but actually come from a higher source. Um, there is no glandular tissue in the posterior pituitary. It is all nervous tissue. Okay? Um, it receives input from the hypothalamus which is above it. I'll show you a picture and this will all, all make sense here in a second. So. Okay, now, this is a very complex system. This is just going to give you an appreciation for it. There's not a lot of stuff you have to remember from this slide, but just, just see my point here. One endocrine gland can produce multiple hormones. So I could have, this is a com, what you need to realize, this is a complex interaction between all the chemicals in your body. Some of them are being released. Others are, are being released to support or antagonize that. Um, if it's released from one place, it could be at the same time released from another place. Uh, it could be released in different levels at any given time in terms of amounts present. It could be taken up at a different rates at any given time. So it's incredibly complex interaction. One gland can produce different types of hormones. A single hormone can be produced by more than one type of gland. Um, a single hormone can have more than one type of target cell, and thus more than one effect. Uh, one, one hormone, could, if it interacts with this target cell, could produce this response. Whereas if it's floating around and it hits a cell over here, it produces a different response. So that's obviously very complicated. Um, a single target cell can be influenced by more than one hormone. Um, you have one thing, something comes in and interacts with it. You know, it could have another hormone that's interacting with it too. So it's, it's very complicated. Now all this goes into it as well. Just You can see um, the rate, like I say, could vary of secretion. That's going to uh, have an effect on, on what is happening. Um, you could have a hormone or a neurotransmitter. So as this is going around, it could be partly being used as a neurotransmitter, partly being used as a hormone. If you have, like, for example, epinephrine, norepinephrine, it could, it's used both as a neurotransmitter and as a hormone. Um, some, are, some organs have exclusively endocrine functions, whereas others, um, like the testes, um, the pancreas, you know, we, we could name a lot, have endocrine and exocrine or non-endocrine functions. Okay, so it just it gets complicated to try to keep track of. All right, this one you do have to know. There's three different types, okay, three different classes of hormones chemically. The first class is called proteins or peptides. Because remember, what peptides are, 
are like polypeptides. They're just like unfinished proteins. They're just chains of amino acids that haven't been completely packed. So they're very similar to proteins. They're just not, they're raw as opposed to finished. So proteins or peptides, we'll put those in the same, in the same bracket, okay? Um, then we have what's called amines, which are actually much shorter. They're, instead of being as big as like a polypeptide, they're actually like one amino acid big. Okay? They're really, really tiny. So these are called amines. So we have proteins and peptides as one group. Then we have amines. And what you'll find about these first two is that they are water-soluble. They're also called uh, hydrophilic. I think I mentioned that down here. The proteins and peptides are, called, are, are hydrophilic. In other words, they're water-soluble. They can get into your bloodstream. They can dissolve in the blood plasma and go around and, and go wherever they need to go. Okay? All right. Um, now, the amines specifically, we'll come back and talk about later, but they are actually secreted by the adrenal medulla. Where's that? At your adrenal gland, on top of your kidneys, we have, just like in the, in the, uh, in the renal system, we talked about the kidneys, the medulla, and the cortex. Which one's on the outside? Think about your brain. It's the same. The very outside is your medulla oblongata on the inside or the outside. Inside, the cortex is on the outside. Okay, <laughs> Lord, people, I tell you what, <clears throat> I'm, I'm assuming too much, I guess, with this. Um, your medulla is the cortex is always the outside layer of something. Okay, um, your renal cortex was we had the medulla down on the inside, then we had the outside. Um, and remember, the nephrons dipped in. Part of them was in the in the cortex, and part of them dipped. The loop of Henle dipped down into the renal medulla. Okay, so we're there. Um, <clears throat> the medulla is the inside. The cortex is the outside. Um, if you think about the adrenal glands, they too have a medulla and a cortex. Okay, um, the cortex is um, going to be some hormones we'll talk about later. Uh, but right now, or I mean some products we'll talk about later, but the amines are going to be secreted by the adrenal medulla on the inside of the adrenal glands. Okay? All right, then the last group is different than these two. This last group are called steroids. Now, you, we've heard this word over and over. Okay? And in the healthcare industry, you hear steroid all the time. What is it? What does it mean? Um, it's, what you'll find is that it's a very generic term because it's a whole entire group of compounds that are related. Okay? Whether it's uh, the type of medication that you're talking about, whether it's cholesterol, whether it's, ep uh, whether it's uh, estrogen, testosterone, all these are, are, are steroid-based molecules. Okay? Um, so I'll talk about them in a minute, but they are secreted by the adrenal cortex. Uh, what you will find is, um, for example, I don't have ovaries, right? Big surprise, right? I don't, I don't have ovaries, but well, now wait a minute. I'm assuming that I don't. Um, just like I'm assuming, you know, I'm, I, maybe if, I'm not trying to, to jump out anywhere, but I'm assuming that, you know, most of us in here, other than myself, don't have testes. Um, but if you do, that's fine. Um, the, in my purse. Just in your purse, yeah, no kidding. Um, the, uh, but you produce testosterone. You have levels of testosterone in your body. I produce estrogen. It's coming from somewhere. Where does it come from? comes from here, okay? Um, the adrenal cortex, we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, so these hormones and the thyroid hormones, uh, as we'll talk, thyroid we'll talk about in the next chapter, these are lipophilic or lipophilic. In other words, they are not water soluble. Um, they are nonpolar compounds, they don't dissolve in water. They, if you want to dissolve them, they have to be hooked onto something and carried, uh, they dissolve in fats and other types of compounds like that, um, but they are not water soluble. So the trick is, if you're going to move this stuff, you're going to have to, since you can't dissolve it in water, you can't just let it float around. It's going to, you know, it's going to cause problems. You have to bind it and incorporate in, it into something uh, that will dissolve in water. Sort of like how soap, we talked about that. I, think. I don't remember if we did or not. Yeah, when we did the emulsification. Um, so what we've, got, what we've got to be able to do is what you're going to see is proteins will be used. Plasma proteins will hook onto these guys, and those proteins can dissolve in water. And then these guys go along for the ride. And then whenever they land wherever they need to go, the proteins will dump these guys off and then allow them to fuse with the plasma membrane, which is lipid, right? And when you take a lipid and a lipid and put them together, they can fuse together and just kind of just slide right in. And the hormone can, can do it that way. So it's different than what's going to happen from up here, okay? Uh, just to give you an example, these are both steroids, okay? Um, <clears throat> this is estradiol, which is going to be the precursor to the feminine hormones. 
And this is testosterone, which is the masculinizing hormone. Um, now, I, again, everyone in here has both of these. Um, it's a matter of how much and to what degree and that kind of thing. Um, but I want you to look at how similar they are chemically. Uh, if you don't have to know a lot about chemistry to see that these pictures look a lot alike. Okay? Um, there's, there's some subtle differences here. Um, there's a couple double bonds here that aren't present over here, and instead there's a, a, a double bond to an oxygen group. But right here is, is from this region and this region is pretty much the difference. Okay, you'll notice that there's a hydrogen stuck out here. You don't care. But the point is they're very similar, but yet realize how huge of a difference they make in terms of feminine characteristics, masculine characteristics, uh, and the interplay with that, not only characteristics, but cycle control, um, and the things that phys anatomically, the things that are produced, that kind of stuff. Um, notice that it's just a few atoms difference in terms of arrangement that, that governs such a complicated and important process. Okay. Um, hopefully you can appreciate that. But, um, all right. Now, as far as the types of hormones, I discussed them, the peptide, proteins, the amines, and the uh, steroids. We're going to look at how they are made, how they are packaged, how they are shipped, how do they differ from each other okay, in that respect. We're not going to get too involved with it, but just know, for example, that uh, when we're dealing with peptide hormones, which are peptide proteins, that's kind of that first group we talked about, how are they are made? <clears throat> They're actually made in certain cells, okay, and they have precursors, which are Precursors are just little chemicals that are made that are unfinished, that are going to get turned into something else. So these precursors of peptides, hormones, are called pre-prohormones. Okay, go figure. Um, they're, they're, there's prohormones, and pre comes before the prohormones. So these are called pre-prohormones. They're made on your ribosomes, which makes sense, right? These are peptides, these are proteins. That's If you think back to the first chapters we talked about, we talked about how proteins are made, DNA is red goes to the ribosome, it gets translated, the amino acids come in, you hook together and you form a protein. So they're going to do that. Some of that genetic code will code for these, in, these, uh, these uh, hormones, or at least the precursors for these. So these, these pep protein sequences are going to get synthesized, you're going to form these little pre-prohormones made on the ribosomes in the ER. Because remember, think back to what we talked about, protein, there's ribosomes, there are two different kinds, there's free floating that just float around, and there's some that are bound to the ER. And the difference between those has to do with the end, the fate of the end product. Where is it going to go? Do you remember the difference? The ones that are produced on the ER are going to go where with respect to the cell? Do you remember? Huh? Okay, but past that. Ultimately, whenever it's all done, where is it going to go? Is it going to stay in the cell, or is it going to be excreted from the cell, exocytose from the cell, whatever you want to call it, versus the, the ribosomes that are free-floating when the proteins land on them and they are synthesized and made, those proteins are going to go somewhere different. So it's a matter of which, which one are you going to guess, because obviously you only need two chances to get this right. The ones on the ER are getting packaged. There's a because it, it's, it, just think about that. It's more complicated because they have to have a, a, a right address on them. They've got to get shipped outside the cell. The ones on the free-floating ribosomes stay inside the cell and become cellular proteins that are involved in those functions. So in this case, that makes sense. They're going to be made on the ribosomes of the ER. Then they're going to go, like you say, to the Golgi body, the Golgi complex. At the Golgi body, they're going to get converted into what's called prohormones. Then they're going to get activated, and eventually they're going to put, be put in secretory vesicles and shipped out of the cell. Okay? Um, and if it's an endocrine cell, that gene's going to be turned on inside that cell, and it's going to be making a lot of these things and shipping them out, and they're going to all be clustered together and form a gland. There's going to be a whole bunch of cells that are doing this, and we call that a gland. Okay. Um, now, cholesterol. Now, I skipped. It's a different order now, right, because I, I did peptide proteins, then I did amines, and I did or steroids. I'm going to go down to steroids now, okay, for the second group here. Um, what all steroid hormones share is the common precursor of cholesterol. Okay, they all require the base of cholesterol and then modify it to turn into these different kinds of proteins. So cholesterol is extremely important. Um, so far, the only really thing we've talked about with cholesterol is like you know its structural usage to space things out between the phospholipids and the cell 
membrane and that kind of thing. But very, very important here. Um, all right. Um, there's, there's enzymes that are present that will take cholesterol, depending on the cell, and modify it into the protein that is necessary, sorry, the hormone that is necessary. Okay, and then they'll secrete it accordingly. Now, as far as what is stored, up here, these things are sort of stored. Uh, the proteins, when they're made, they can, they can be stored for a little while. What you will find is that the hormones, the, the steroid hormones, they are never stored in the body. They are constantly made. Um, the only thing that is stored is cholesterol. Now, our body has a habit of storing cholesterol. Um, so it could be good and bad. It depends on, you know, in the person, what the bodily interaction is, where this cholesterol ends up going. We talked already about, uh, you know, high density, low density lipoproteins, and, and when we talked about cardiovascular disease and things like that. Um, but here we need it obviously for hormone synthesis. So, all right. The amine hormones, the tiny ones, that's what's left here, are actually just made from an uh, amino acid tyrosine. So it's, it's not a complicated process to make yet. Um, they, they're small enough so they will be stored. So they're secure. All right. Um, now remember what I said, anything that's hydrophilic, which consists of these two groups, the proteins, polypeptides, and the amines, those are hydrophilic. They can be dissolved. They are going to dissolve in the blood plasma, and they're going to bind to receptors on, on their target cells whenever they bump into them. Okay? Um, now, the lipophilic hormones the, that are not water-soluble, but instead are fat-soluble or, or lipid-soluble, um, they are going to be reversibly bound to plasma proteins. That means that the proteins can be soluble, right? So what they're going to do is, is hook on to some of these, mole some of these lipophilic hormones as they're, being traveled, as they're traveling throughout the, the body. It'll bind to them, and then the protein component will allow it to stay dissolved. And then when it hits the cell, when it hits its target cell, it'll let go of it, and then they confuse the, lip the lipophilic hormone and then confuse with the lipid bilayer and then uh, actually probably end up entering the cell is what it will do. Okay, because <clears throat> it says right here, Lipophilic and thyroid hormones, which we'll talk about next time, uh, will actually pass through the target cell membrane and bind to receptors inside the target cell. The difference is these water-soluble ones up here, the, uh, uh, the, poly the proteins and the peptides and the amines, these guys, they're water-soluble, they dissolve, and when they land on the surface of a cell, they typically don't go inside. They stay on the outside, they bond with a protein that's sticking out from the surface, and when they do, they change the chemistry and start a second messenger system. And that's how they work. With these guys down here, these lipophilic, because they can actually come in contact with the plasma membrane, sometimes they actually, they'll actually fuse with the plasma membrane and actually enter and go inside the cell, which is a very different way to work. It's more direct. Not only that, but these guys can actually go all the way into the nucleus sometimes and get on your DNA and actually go all the way down to the you know, grassroots level, get all the way down and affect your DNA and what is being coded for at that particular time. So obviously there's a big difference in the way these these two groups work. Okay. All right. But the bottom line is, uh, the way these hormones usually work is we know that all, all your DNA, right, um, different sequences of DNA make up what we call genes. And all your genes code for proteins, all of them. So we are a big collection of proteins. And what you will see is that all these hormones work on proteins. They will go inside. They will either start a second messenger system or they will they themselves go inside and change something about the proteins that are present. Either cause them to cause some that are not being produced to be produced, cause some that are being produced to not be produced, or change the levels, increase or decrease what is being produced. Okay? So it's all about changing the proteins that are present. More or less, yes or none. You know? um, all right. There are a few of these hormones, lipophilic hormones, that actually can screw with the plasma membrane a little bit and cause them to become more permeable or less permeable to things. But by and large, they work. They work this way. Okay. okay, I talked about how they activate a second messenger system. Um, I actually didn't click on this. I don't remember what this is, so let's, let's check this out. Load. This is the first one. I like these. Uh, Here we go. This looks like it's going to be a lipophilic hormone, so this should be one that doesn't just react to the outside of a cell. We should see a, an inward movement, okay, unless I'm completely wrong. Sure Steroid hormones are not water-soluble.
They travel in the blood attached to protein carriers. When steroid hormones arrive at their target cells, they dissociate from their protein carrier and pass through the plasma membrane of the cell. Some steroid hormones bind to specific receptor proteins in the cytoplasm and then move as a hormone receptor complex into the nucleus. Other steroids travel directly into the nucleus before encountering their receptor proteins, not shown. The hormone receptor protein, activated by binding to the hormone, is now able to bind to specific regions of the DNA. These DNA regions are known as the hormone response elements. The binding of the hormone receptor complex has a direct effect on the level of transcription at that site. Messenger RNA, mRNA, is produced, which then codes for the synthesis of specific proteins. So you can imagine then, you know, assuming there's a lot that could go wrong, we got to assume that this hormone is shaped correctly, it is produced correctly, so that when it, number one, it can actually bond to this. Number two, it can fuse with this properly and come inside. Number three, when it makes it in here, it'll interact with this substrate protein that's supposed to be there, and that chemical bond can work because if anything's structurally different than the way it's supposed to, that won't work. Once that happens, it can get inside here and mess with your DNA. Let's hope that this works well because otherwise it's going to be messing with places it shouldn't mess with, and then who knows what will go wrong there, right? So if everything works properly, you can see how that hormone, when released, travels around. You can see why this takes a little while, right? Um, like in the case, of, especially when we get into female physiology and you think about like monthly cycles and that kind of thing, it takes a little while. This is not a one-day thing. Um, other things work more quickly, certainly. Um, do I? <laughs> well, um, <clears throat> but when you get in here like this, you directly alter the amount or the type or whatever of proteins being, uh, being made. And then that protein, you know, obviously what, what this has caused the effect of this protein being produced. Now, depending on the situation, this could cause something to happen now that normally wouldn't have. This could cause something to shut down that normally wouldn't have. It just depends. And this is how we maintain constant sort of overarching control in our body system. And that, and realize that, uh, what else happening here? I hope that if, if you don't get anything out of this class, realize how complex our body is because, you know, not only is this happening, that's just one example of one hormone and one little protein that's made. You got to realize that who knows how many of these are happening all at the same time. Not only that, but your nervous system is firing. All of your receptors are working. Blood's getting pumped through your brain. All of your, your nerve networks are firing in your brain. Your digestive system's working. Everything else, think of all the complications of your respiratory and, you know, uh, urinary system. All of that's working at the same time. How do... It, Seriously, you go through every day and you say, why does this have to happen to me? We're, we got the wrong attitude about this. I know it doesn't seem fair, but at the same time, when you learn more about this, you start thinking, why in the world doesn't something bad happen every single day to me? Um, because everything could. It could all just break down in, in a matter of seconds, okay? Literally, less than seconds sometimes. Uh, all it would take. All right. <clears throat> amazing thing, human bodies. Absolutely amazing. All right, so we, we talked about this. Let's see, is there anything else up here? Um, let's see what this one is. The same thing. So. All right. Um, now, one thing, um, this was supposed to be, I think I picked the wrong one, but um, a lipophilic hormone does what we just saw, okay? Um, a hydrophilic hormone, maybe I clicked the wrong one of those, you can go back and check. But there should be another one that instigates a, um, let me see if, do what? Well, I clicked, I clicked the steroid hormone action, which is lipophilic, but I'm thinking probably this one down here. Let's see. Yeah, here's a water soluble. And therefore, unable to cross the hydrophobic plasma membrane. So they can't the enter like cells. the other one did. Instead, it binds to receptor proteins located in the plasma membrane and does not enter the cell. When epinephrine binds to beta adrenergic receptors on the liver cell, G proteins <laughs> on the inner side of the cell membrane are activated. 
Each G protein is composed of three subunits, and the binding of epinephrine to its receptor protein causes one of the G protein subunits to dissociate from the other two. Got the that. G protein subunit, which dissociates from the others, carries a GDP, which is replaced by GTP when Nine. the subunit is activated. Niner, niner. The activated G protein subunit then diffuses within the plasma membrane until it encounters adenyl cyclase, a membrane enzyme that is inactive until it interacts with the G protein subunit. When activated by the G protein subunit, adenyl cyclase catalyzes the formation of CAMP from ATP. The CAMP formed at the inner surface of the membrane diffuses within the cytoplasm, where it binds to and activates protein kinase A, an enzyme that adds phosphate groups to specific cellular proteins. In liver cells, the protein kinase A phosphorylates and thereby activates another enzyme <laughs> called phosphorylase, which converts glycogen you don't have to into know glucose 6 phosphate. The glucose 6 phosphate is then converted to glucose. <laughs> Through this multi step mechanism, epinephrine causes the liver to secrete glucose I into the blood. Get the general the idea here. Look what's happening. Reaction. You get what's going on here? Okay, so you don't know all those steps and all those names of all these things. But think about what you just saw. What you saw was what epinephrine does on a liver cell. Now we know that epinephrine is one of like adrenaline type of things. Okay? We know that liver has the ability to store glycogen and then release it as glucose later on. Okay? What, what this is, is an example of how our body, under stressful situations, when adrenaline kicks in instantly, how one of the effects is glucose being released in the body. Okay? This is how. When, when epinephrine comes in contact with the cell, it's, it's hydrophilic, it can't get in, but what it will do is bind with one of these proteins. And when it does, yes, all these big letters, things, and names come about, but realize what it is. It's a series of biochemical events that is called a second messenger system. It has a message. It started here, and by the time it got down here, that message was delivered. Okay? Um, now, there's obviously you know, a lot of study in this pathway that, that got to this point. There's a lot of things that could go wrong, but assuming that it goes right, here's where we end up. And what you see is glycogen... Through all of this series of events, glycogen is being digested and split up into glucose fragments that are then going to be squirted out and into the body and into the bloodstream for our body to use as a quick energy source. Think about how fast that happens. Think about how often that happens. That's one glycogen molecule being broken down in one liver cell. There's millions of these things in one liver cell, and there's millions of liver cells, and, and who knows how often that's happening. Okay, so... It's, it gives you a, an idea as to how, the level of control that our body is exercising under these situations. It's just not like a switch flips on and all of a sudden a bunch of glucose dumps out. There's a high level of control, and there's a lot of checks and balances to keep everything the way it's supposed to be. Uh, it's, 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 it's actually slow when you think about it. In, in real life, it's fast, but compared to like a nervous response and that kind of stuff, this is actually a, a fairly slow event that's happening. But the, the whole point of, of this especially is to show you the difference between lipophilic and hydrophilic hormones and how they interact. One stays out here and does all this stuff. The other one just comes right through and goes straight to the DNA. It doesn't take something and convert it. It actually just changes the proteins that are made okay, in the lipophilic. All right. All right. <clears throat> um, this is just a summary of what we already talked about. So, and this is a picture of a lipophilic hormone going inside and working, but the animation was better than this, so we'll skip that one too. Okay, what are some other things that our hormones can do? Um, we know that the concentration of hormone changes. Um, it goes through cycles, certain things. There are things in biology that we call circadian rhythms. They are natural fluctuations of hormone levels and proteins that are present in the body. Typically, and what's really neat, is that the light-dark cycle that we experience, uh, day and night and that kind of stuff, light seems to be a very de important determining factor in terms of what triggers these cycles and what maintains these cycles. Um, it's been shown in multiple studies that if you, you know, take animals and put them in situations where uh, you control the, the energy field and you, you can control the amount of, of light that's present, either off or on constantly, 
um, you can really screw up the circadian rhythms. You can screw up these, these normal circulation of, of, of hormones in, in the body. Um, so as far as the availability of a hormone, it's going to depend on a lot of things. Whether or not the hormone is available for use depends on how fast it's secreted. You know, you're going to need it. Is it. Are you using it up faster than it's secreted, or is it secreted too much and there's too much in the bloodstream? How fast does it work? That's what that means. Rate of metabolic activation. How, how fast can, can it be com communicate with the target cell to get its response done? How well does it bind to proteins? If it's lipophilic and it doesn't bind very well to proteins, it's not going to get where it needs to go. Okay. Um, how well is it removed from the blood once it's used? That kind of thing. So all those are going to go into play. All right. Negative feedback, we'll see this happen. We know what that means, right? If something calls for the production of the hormone, once the hormone is produced, it'll feed back and shut off that process so that the hormone stops being produced. That's negative feedback. We'll get that with all our hormones. Now, it may be tropic. As you will see, uh, say a gonadotropin-releasing uh, hormone is going to cause the, re the release of gonadotropin hormone, and that's going to go down and produce things like testosterone, estrogen, that kind of stuff. Now, three steps later, the final product, let's say testosterone, can then go back and feed back and shut off that high one. Okay, so you know that's it may be down the line before this negative feedback happens, but it will happen. It will shut things off. Okay. <clears throat> um, now there's a lot of endocrine uh, systems that I, I sort of alluded to already that have neuroendocrine reflexes. In other words, um, the nervous system is tied in with the endocrine system so that instantly things are released, as opposed to something's released in the blood, it travels around, hits something else, causes something to be released. That's a, that's pretty slow. Other times, it can be hardwired. There can be a nervous feed right into this tissue, and it can immediately be released. It just depends. All right, and like I said, a lot of hormones vary by what's called a diurnal or else circadian rhythm. Um, and this is sort of showing you, like if this is noon and this is midnight, you can see how very regularly things sort of increase and then decrease throughout the day, that kind of stuff. Uh, there's a lot of neat research out there right now with this kind of stuff, things called like clock proteins. Um, whenever like someone says my biological clock is ticking, there's actually truth to that. There is a biological clock that we have in terms of uh, proteins that are present certain, at certain times, certain intervals, um, either whether it's a 24-hour cycle, whether it's a 28-day cycle, whatever. Um, there, are, there are certain uh, patterns that, that are revealed, and, and the presence and the concentration of certain proteins are indicative of this clock so to speak. So it is, it's, it's very interesting. All right. Um, now we know that you can have hyper or hypo secretion of hormones, and that's going to uh, cause a lot of different conditions that, that we're familiar with, maybe some that we're not familiar with. But um, too much, too little uh, is going to have effects, certainly. Um, what could be the culprit of this? Obviously hereditary. Um, a lot of this is genetic. We know that hormones are going to be uh, Especially the amines, or especially the peptide protein hormones, are coded for directly in the DNA. So if there's any sort of genetic abnormality, that's going to be inherited. Um, dietary deficiency. Um, you think of uh, like cholesterol, and think of uh, steroid hormones. There's you have to bring that in from an external source, or or else bring in the the contents to make up cholesterol. Um, so we have to bring that kind of stuff in. Um, immunologic factors, uh, disease processes, all these things could, what if our immune system interacts with hormones? What if it recognizes them as foreign? All that kind of stuff. So there's a lot of things that are going to play into this. Okay, now what else is interesting is what's called either primary or secondary hypo or hyper secretion. And what that has to do with is this tropic level thing. Uh, for example, if, there's, if someone's producing too much testosterone, where is this happening? This could happen at many levels. The problem could be primary. Um, it could be the fact that the actual cells, let's say in a male, in the cells that are, that are in the testes, there's something wrong with those cells, and they're producing too much testosterone. Or it could be that the signal that it is receiving, the testes are receiving from the, from the pituitary gland, there's something wrong with that hormone up there, so that by the time it gets to the testes, it's screwed up producing too much. Or, even worse, it could go even higher up to the hypothalamus, and the very highest hormone could be what screwed up. If it's localized, and the problem is within that itself, like in the testes, well, that, that's the primary problem. Secondary problem means it's up the chain somewhere, and it's trickled down. Okay? All right. 
Um, hormone replacement therapy is, is a big deal now um, in medicine. Um, oftentimes, hormone replacement therapy works if you can regulate it. If you can take a look at a person's physiological history and you can you know, calculate dosage correctly and, and get them to take the medication regularly, a lot of times hormone replacement therapy works, works very well. Uh, other times it doesn't. It, it just depends. Uh, my wife knows more about this than, than I do. She, she studied this a little more than I have. Um, I'd like to get her in so she can talk to you about some of the stuff that she learned, but she never wants to come in. Um, <coughs> yeah, uh -huh. careful what you wish for. Um, <coughs> the, uh, it's, uh, there's some new stuff out there that's actually kind of neat, especially, well, I'm, of course, I'm talking about a female hormone replacement therapy. This is what I was referring to with her. Um, uh, there's a lot of neat stuff, uh, some new stuff. Uh, you'll find that a lot, uh, and make sure you add, I don't know if, you ever, if this ever applies to anybody, and if you ever get to the point, or if you are now, whatever, or you know someone. Um, there's some stuff that has changed significantly over the past few years, and, and depending on the, the, the person that you are visiting, whether it's an FNP or whether it's an MD, um, who's prescribing some of the stuff for you, um, make sure you, that they're aware of the latest stuff out there, because you assume a lot of times that they are, but that's, sometimes it's not safe to make those assumptions. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of increased risk of things, heart disease and, and a lot of stroke and that kind of stuff when you get to dealing with uh, estrogen supplementation, or, you know, replacement therapy, um, progesterone, that kind of stuff. So, Anyways, that's a little out of my, out of my field, but I, I know just enough to be dangerous about it, so I'll, I'll stop. Um, <coughs> all right. Um, again, hypersecretion, just like hyposecretion, can be primary or secondary. Um, now, what you're going to get a lot of times with hypersecretion, not a lot of times, but what you can get um, more than you would hyposecretion is tumors on the, on the endocrine gland that's in question. Um, obviously, we know that tumors represent abnormal cell growth. So if these cells are growing abnormally, chances are they're producing their contents abnormally as well. Um, so they're either producing too much of it or faulty versions of it, one of the two, and that's a, a good way to get hypersecretion, like a thyroid tumor or, or something like that. Um, all right. Um, and let's see, what does it say? I can't read this. Oh, yeah, and the problem could be not with the hormone itself. What this saying, it, it, the bottom bullet here says is that it could be a problem with the actual target cell. Um, your hormone could be fine, but when it interacts with the cell that it's supposed to interact with, what if there's something wrong genetically with that cell? What if the proteins are wrong? You know, and there, there can't be that communication. Sort of like with insulin and diabetics. Your insulin could be fine. Um, you know, like with type 2 diabetes, insulin's fine. There's no need for more insulin problem is with that person's cells, and they're not interacting with the insulin properly. Same thing can happen with the hormone. Okay, and again, uh, like I said, this is complicated because hormones, it's not like one little hormone close up to a cell acts on it, and that's all that happens. We know that there's a whole lot of stuff happening at one time. There's different hormones acting on the same cell. There's hormones that reinforce each other. There's hormones that work against each other that are released depending upon what our body perceives at any given point throughout our body. So we have what's called permissiveness, synergism, and antagonism. Um, permissiveness, sort of self-explanatory, so you think about permission and that kind of thing. One hormone must be present in sufficient amounts for the full effect of another hormone to occur. So it's sort of a checks and balances kind of thing. One of this hormone could be released from another process, but we don't want it necessarily always exerting its effect. So a way to control that is um, it will only be able to affect these target cells, these specific specific target cells only when something else has been released in sufficient amount so that it interacts and causes a chemistry change to where now this other one could interact. Does that make sense? Sort of. Um, you've got, <coughs> if you've got a cell here, a target cell, and you've got this hormone that's sort of floating around because something else is triggered. It's used for something else, we'll say. But it has the ability, there's receptors on the cell for this hormone, even though that right now we don't want it to interact with that particular hormone. Because, like I said, some other bodily activity has caused the production of this hormone. Now, the only time then, we want to be able to control when it reacts to this particular group of cells. So as it comes in contact with this, if we want to make sure that as it's there, it's not going to interact with this cell, we're going to have like a, a double team on this cell. So that there has to be another hormone that is, is released in response to what's going on here, that when it comes in, it starts binding and changes the chemistry enough to where now this hormone can bond. Okay? And when it does, that's permissiveness. In other words, this one couldn't happen until it got permission from the other thing that was going on here. And once that happened, then it could come in here and then it could exert its effect.
because up to that point, we didn't really want it to exert its effects because it was being used for something else in another place. Okay? That's called permissiveness. Synergism means they complement each other and combine their effects. It's subtly different than what we have here. In synergism, they mean syn we're working together. A hormone will come in, and really what we want out of it is not just what it gives by itself. We want another hormone to come in, and together they work, they work as a cohesive unit to produce the outcome that we want. Okay, that's synergism. They're actually working together. Antagonism is they actually cancel each other out. They try to work against each other. It's a checks and balances situation. Um, we, we want one hormone, if it's, if it's too high and it's working and it's exerting effect on these cells, we, we get another one to come in to sort of work in the opposite direction, to sort of keep it in check, to keep it from working. So there's three different ways that these hormones can work. Complicated. Um, now this is interesting. I've, wa I, I've talked already about uh, sort of the clock proteins and the circadian rhythms. Um, I want to mention the pineal gland. Um, it's, it's very, very small. It's a small little area in the brain. Let's see if I got a picture. It's way back here. It's not listed on here, I don't think, but it's right back in here. Okay. Um, maybe you've heard about this. You've heard of melatonin. I don't know if you have or not. It can induce sleep. That's what it can do. Um, sort of like the sleep medication, that kind of stuff. Um, but it's hormonal in nature. Um, <clears throat> but the pineal gland can secrete a hormone called melatonin. Um, and what melatonin does is it helps keep your body circadian rhythms in sync with the light-dark cycle I was talking about. So, again, this is largely not understood. The pathways by which this works we don't really know yet. Um, but one thing seems to be that there's a link between the clock proteins and as they circulate through the body and the hormone levels and that kind of thing with the light-dark cycle. And, there, and what ties those two things together seems to be this particular hormone and the way that it works. Okay? Um, now, there's another thing called the suprachiasmatic nucleus. Now, what that means, it's supra means sort of above, chiasmata, if you think about the chiasma, is where two things cross. Like your optic chiasma, remember, imagine your brain and eyeballs, and the eyeballs, the optic nerve sticking out, like you just had a set, a set of eyeballs and a brain connected. Wherever these eyeballs come back, this optic nerve, and they cross right at the very, right in, I don't know if it shows in here, but right up in here, there's a, there's a place where the, the optic nerve crosses. Okay, right above that, that's why it's called suprachiasmatic. The suprachiasmatic nucleus. The nucleus in this case is not a nucleus of a cell, but just a collection of cells. It's called a nucleus. Um, okay, <clears throat> anyway, the SCN, the suprachiasmatic nucleus, ha is very important in these daily rhythms as well. Now, <clears throat> melatonin is important in linking the daily rhythms with a light dark cycle. As far as the daily rhythms themselves, the SCN seems to have a lot of control over that. But now we're in the brain. Now we're in brain tissue. We're in a largely uncharted waters compared to the rest of the body. We don't know. It's impossible to map that because all you have is this big, dense collection of neurons firing on top of each other. It's not nice and separated like the rest of the body. So here's where we start losing a lot of our information. We can say this region is responsible for this and et cetera, but as far as explaining how, we really don't have a way to do that. Um, but we do know that this tissue area tends to secrete these clock proteins that I'm talking about. Okay? Um, and then you get cyclic changes in your effector organs throughout the day. You know, we know that like uh, blood pressure can change in the morning versus night, you know, and all that kind of stuff. And all, all kinds of things throughout the body can, can vary uh, even within a 24-hour period. So, um, <clears throat> okay. Uh, I talked about this already. Changes in light intensity seem to be the minor, the, the major, sorry, environmental cue. Um, let's see. Oh. Now, melatonin seems to have other functions not related to circadian timekeeping. For example, um, it can be given to someone to basically make them go to sleep without hypnotizing them. In other words, just sort of make you fall asleep as opposed to just blank and not remember anything. Um, actually, natural sleep like you would normally. Like when you go to bed and you wake up, you generally remember what just happened. You don't remember everything that happened in your sleep, your dream, necessarily. Sometimes you do, but you know what I mean. Sometimes... You know, with a, with a drug-induced stupor, you wake up, and then right before, you know, 15, half an hour, 15, 30 minutes before whatever just happened, you don't have any idea what just happened, okay? That's not natural sleep. Uh, all right. <clears throat> but the side effect of taking melatonin, of course, is that it inhibits hormones that stimulate reproductive activity. Not only the ability to use these um, parts, so to speak, um, but also the drive that, that you would use to want to use them. So libido... Um, the, the, the hormones that, that cause the activity in general, all of that can be taken.
can be a side effect, a lowering of those, a side effect of people who use that on melatonin. Um, but it is also an effective antioxidant. Um, again, this word, um, antioxidants goes back to uh, free radicals that form. And free radicals form because of all those changes in electrons that were happening in the electron transport chain. They are dangerous little things that are floating around. Um, <clears throat> you, wanna, you want to take things that have been oxidized and anti-oxidize them for safety precautions or safety reasons. So you know, a lot of things can do that. A lot of vitamins can do that. Um, all your shakes, your health shakes have antioxidants and all that other crap if you buy into that. All right. Um, now, the pituitary gland. Now we're getting into the uh, actual types of hormones here. Take a look. Here's the very, very small little pituitary gland. Here's a blown up picture of it. Here's the optic chiasm I was talking about. So you can notice that all this hormonal stuff is all very close together. Right in here is where you're going to find this, um, you know, all of this area in here. Your hypothalamus, your optic chiasm. Um, here is your uh, pituitary gland. Now we've got front and back. We've got anterior, we've got posterior. These two things are colored differently. They look differently because this is glandular tissue, the anterior. The posterior is not. It is nervous tissue. Okay? All right, <clears throat> take a look. Ultimately, we know how important our hypothalamus is. It is our center of our homeo of homeostasis in our body. It's, it seems to be the main processing unit for everything that's going on, even though it's so small. It's kind of amazing. Um, but anyways, we have cells. Obviously, this is not the scale. But we have cells that are in the hypothalamus that communicate directly with the pituitary gland. Now, the products that are secreted by the pituitary gland go out and affect the rest of the body, all of our hormones affect all of our hormones. So we've got to make sure this doesn't go wrong. But what you will notice is, if you take a look here, this is the posterior pituitary gland. You'll see that these, horm sorry, these uh, 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 neurons that are in the hypothalamus, these cell bodies and the axons are leaving. Notice where they go. They actually leave and go through the stalk and down to the posterior pituitary. And look what they do. The contents, they manufacture a couple different types of hormones. The contents of which, those hormones, I guess, are dumped out and secreted right here from these synaptic areas. But instead of jumping to another nerve cell, they're actually released right out. They get into the bloodstream, and then they travel. Okay? So that's why the posterior pituitary is not glandular. There are no cells in here that's producing hormones. There is just a tunnel, a channel, that is channeling the feed from up here, what is being produced, and it passes straight through here and hits the bloodstream and goes. Okay? Now, as the difference is, as you'll see on the next picture, I think, uh, if not, I'll tell you, there's a feed coming in from here that goes to the front. So there's a lot of passage, a lot of traffic going through here. Some of these neurons are feeding into here. And anything that feeds into here actually will, there's cells, there's different glands, there's different cells in here. So these things are like this that are dumped off in here, instead of going into the bloodstream, they go into these cells that are around here. And then all of these cells that are around here then release their products into the bloodstream. There's a middle step right here. But because there are cells capable of manufacturing their own hormones in here, this is glandular tissue, whereas that is just nervous tissue. Okay, does that make sense? All right. I think I've explained all of this. Um, there are a couple of different names associated with this. Um, hypothesis, not hypothesis, like an educated guess. But hypophysis, right here, is in reference to the pituitary gland. Okay? So we've got what's called a neurohypophysis and an adenohypophysis. What is the difference? Neuro, this guy right here, because it's all neurological. So the neurohypophysis is the posterior pituitary. The adenohypophysis is the anterior pituitary. Okay? So if you see those words, that's, that's what they mean. All right, a couple things about the posterior lobe because we're going to mention it because there's only a couple things with it. Uh, the rest of the stuff is going to be from the anterior pituitary. So the posterior lobe and the hypothalamus together um, acts as a unit to secrete two things. Vasopressin, which is ADH, this takes us back to blood pressure control, back to the urino uh, uh, urology and when we talked about nephrology and and ADH and how it can cause sodium retention and increase blood pressure. Way up top, ADH is that important. It's, it's up in the hypothalamus. There are no hormones above this. Okay, this is one of the top dogs. There's only a few of them. ADH is one, so obviously it's very important. The other one is oxytocin. 
Now that has much more to do with you than it does me. Um, oxytocin is what induces uterine contractions. Um, Pitocin is, is the drug that, that mimics oxytocin. Um, and also you'll find that in, in the terms of formation of breast milk and the ducts that are associated with breast milk, um, oxytocin is going to be important for that as well. We'll talk more about that in detail a little bit later. Um, so there's two things up here. Okay, so in this case, these two different dots you see, that's all that you're going to see. If you had a, in the, neuro, sorry, in the neuro hypothesis, in the posterior pituitary, it looks like this is oxytocin and this is vasopressin or ADH. Okay, those are the same thing. All right. Um, <clears throat> now remember, the posterior lobe does not produce these. They are just the terminals where this has happened. They're actually produced up in the hypothalamus. Just keep that in mind. Um, they are stored, however, in these neuron terminals. They can be stored down here. They can collect themselves down here okay, in these little ends before they're released. Okay, it says click here. I can't resist. Let's, let's see what we got. groups of hypothalamic nuclei. The axons for the hypothalamic nerve terminate near the stalk of the pituitary, where a network of capillaries called the hypothalamic portal vessels is present. GnRH is released into the portal blood, where the peptide hormones are transferred directly to the anterior pituitary. There, the hormone binds to the GnRH receptors on gonadotrope cells to release FSH and LH into the oh, I see. circulation. Pick the wrong the one. Stimulation of the I'll show you what this means. This one is. <clears throat> notice the difference. This is for. This is from a, a, an agricultural site. This is for animals, but it works the same way. Um, here's the stalk. This is also called a hypophyseal portal system because this is the shunt through which all this communication happens. But here will be the wires you can see from the neurons going to the posterior, right? And here would be the anterior. And you're going to find that this is more complicated. This is glandular tissue. You can see cells in here. Over here, you don't. What would happen is, if this was uh, oxytocin or ADH, and it was coming down through here, it would be released at these terminals directly in the bloodstream and then go. Okay? Whereas over here, what would have to happen is, it talked about gonadotropin releasing hormone. It said GNH or whatever, GNRH. Don't worry about that. I'll talk about that in a second. Um, it's a type of hormone that could exist in the anterior pituitary. Um, depending on what's fired and what's released, one of, let's say, you know, five or six things to come out of here, travel down here, and float around until it hits the cell that it's supposed to hit. In which case, those cells are going to go have, you know, going to uh, respond either by taking the hormone in, like the lipophilic hormone, or it's going to be a, a, a second messenger system with a with water soluble hormone. It just depends. It's going to come down here, it's going to hit these cells, and then these cells are going to start cranking out whatever hormone is signaled by what was released up here. And then that'll go into the bloodstream, and that'll shoot out, and that'll leave, and that'll take its effect. So here we've just got one step. Over here we've got one, two steps. That's the difference between them. All right. <clears throat> like I said, tropic hormones. <clears throat> now, the anterior pituitary. When it's going to go through these types of hormones, we should be able to go through these pretty quickly because you understand the, the concept behind them now. Here's some of the hormones. There's going to be six. One, two, three, four, five, six different hormones. Okay? The anterior pituitary will, will produce six tropic hormones that will then go out into the body and affect all the other hormones that are. The posterior pituitary does not produce any, but it does take a feed from the hypothalamus. It will take two of them, right? What two? What two hormones? Posterior pituitary. Oxytocin and vasopressin or ADH, right? Okay, so what's in the anterior pituitary? All those cells that have the ability to take those feeds in from the hypothalamus. All right, <laughs> growth hormone. HGH stands for human growth hormone. Makes you grow. It makes you not only grow, but once you reach maturity, it makes your body do the things that would normally be conducive to growth, like uh, break down, build up bones, build up muscles, uh, break down products in the liver, that kind of stuff. Everything that's conducive to that type of growth is going to be controlled by the growth hormone. So it's, 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 uh, it's tropic. It's going to have effects on other places than just one. Okay? Thyroid stimulating hormone. Guess what? It stimulates the thyroid. Okay? Not hard to figure out. It's tropic. 
It stimulates the secretion and growth of the thyroid. When we get into the thyroid, you'll see that there's a couple hormones in the thyroid that are affected by this. Okay? Adrenocorticotropin hormone. You'll see a lot of abbreviations. Okay? Adreno Adrenocorticotropic hormone. Tropic means because it is tropic. It's going to control something. Cortico because it's released in the what? It's going to affect hormones where? It's going to, <clears throat> there's something called corticoids. It has to do with the cortex, that kind of stuff. Well, you'll see where this plays out a little bit later. Adreno, it's going to be an adrenal glands. Okay? It's going to affect those hormones. So this is also abbreviated ACTH for adrenocorticotropic hormone. All right. Stimulates the growth and the secretion of hormones from the adrenal cortex. Go figure. Adreno, cort, like cortex. Okay, that's where it got its name. All right. Follicle stimulating hormone. When you think of follicles, what I want you to think of to remember this is like follicles are sort of like little bubbles that form inside something. In the case of ovaries, it's going to be the little eggs that are going to be released. Okay? What you're going to see is that follicle stimulating hormone is going to stimulate the growth and development of the ovarian follicles in females and the sperm in males. Both, it's, it's both hormones, we have follicle stimulating hormone is the same in both sexes. The difference is that the target cells that are present for them to react with. If you have ovaries present, then the reaction is going to be very different than if you have testes present. Okay? Um, but the hormone, this one is the same, so that's interesting. Okay? You also find out that when I get into reproduction, I talk about development, when you get like a, a five-week-old embryo and you take any other vertebrate animal that's out there, you cannot tell up through the first five weeks what animal is what. If I gave you a rabbit and I gave you a human, you would not be able to tell the difference. We have gills and tails. Um, why, why do we have this? Good question. Why do males have nipples? Another good question. Um, <clears throat> the, the luteinizing hormone is going to also be related to uh, for sexual biology. LH, luteinizing hormone, stimulates ovulation and luteinization. And I'll talk about this, what this is. It has to do with pregnancy. Um, and it stimulates testosterone secretion. So what you have here is actual biological, sexually necessary cells and, and things like that. Ovarian follicles, which are going to make the eggs and the sperm, right? And then you've got, in those same areas, not necessarily that which makes a person, but that which controls the person that is. In other words, you know, hormones, estrogen, testosterone, the kind of things that are masculinizing factors and, 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 and uh, feminizing factors. So they both have to do with sexual, they have sexual connotation, but one is biological in terms of, well, both biological, but one has to do with the actual gametes, the sex cells that are produced. One has to do with the effects, what you see, masculine, feminine, that kind of stuff. You'll see what I mean as, as I go through this. Um, prolactin is going to be the last one that's secreted. Prolactin in favor of lactation. Um, it's going to help produce milk and release milk and that kind of stuff. 